So I want to tell you a quick story about technology. I was sitting on this bus, it was completely packed, all the seats are taken, and at the next stop, a big group of people get on, and so I have to give up my seat to a youngish mum and a baby. And so now I'm standing up in this scrum of people, and this baby, it must have only been about two months old, but it already knew how to be angry. It was an angry, angry baby, deep down, and it decides that I've wronged it in some really fundamental way, because it just looks up at me, it looks me right in the eye, and it just starts to bawl. And its mother, she looks down at her infant child, and I'm guessing that she really loves this kid like you always love the first one, because she follows its eye line, <laughs> and she tracks up, and she looks at me, and she glares, and she rolls her eyes, and she looks back out the window as if her child's integral fury is somehow my fault. And so this bus journey has gone from being kind of uncomfortable to awful, just awful, and for everyone on board, and it's at that moment that a group of teenagers start to play music on their phones. Um, there's five of them, they must be about 14 years old, which means that they are old enough to not really care what adults think anymore, but they're certainly not old enough to have decent taste in music. <laughs> um, and you can actually hear the rest of the passengers on this bus collectively sigh, because it's not a long journey, and no one's going to cause enough of a fuss to push their way through the crowd and tell them to stop. But in this crappy public transport moment, when uh, you know the older couple behind me are already starting to complain about just how rude teenagers are today, um, I'm no longer feeling frustrated. I'm no longer feeling guilty for trying to stare down an overly aggressive baby. <laughs> because this girl and another one of her teenage friends, they start doing this really mundane thing. They start putting on their makeup. But what seems weird to me is that one of them has just pulled this big mirror out of her bag. And then I realized, no, it's not a big mirror. It's an oldish iPad with the front camera turned on, and it's being used just like a mirror. And it, the, its case was covered with stickers and the Tipex names of various bands. But what was so striking was just how normalized this advanced piece of plastic and glass had become. Um, it was a trivial moment. Uh, but it was also one of those oddly vertiginous moments of modern life where you realize that experience has changed in some small but significant way. Uh, a 15-minute bus journey, and I saw this thing used um, as a mirror, as a stereo to send an email, to look something up, to play a video game. Um, every time I glanced over, it was being put to some new use. It had been built for this girl into the practice of being a teenager. In the same way that that baby was angry, right at its core, this girl was switched on. It's easy to say that we live in a moment of profound and rapid technological progress. This has become a truism, a less than interesting fact about our world. Um, we are told that we can either be for or against progress. Um, and TED speakers and attendees are, by and large, meant to be for the advancement of our material culture, of the things, the artifacts that we surround ourselves with. But I think that progress is a very hard thing to define. What does it mean to say that things are getting better? The American essayist and poet Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote in the 1860s, it is too plain that with the material power, the moral progress has not kept pace. It appears that we have not made a judicious investment. I think that I agree. I have little faith in an idea of progress that doesn't also include us getting better as a species and as an increasingly globally coherent group. But that is another much, much longer discussion. Um, the science fiction writer Neil Stevenson makes the simpler point, perhaps, in a, a talk called On Getting Big Stuff Done, where he notes that in the first 70 years of the 20th century, we went from not believing that heavier-than-air flight was possible to walking on the moon. Stevenson argues that if you took an American from 1900 and you sent them forward in a time machine to 1968, then when he or she returned home, they wouldn't even really have the vocabulary to describe what they had seen. And yet, he says, if you took someone from 1968 and you sent them forward to now, then when he or she returned home, they would have a, a far easier job of articulating the change. And Stevenson says, sure, this person would probably think that the internet was very cool and typewriters had become computers and we all carry around phones in our pockets. But what had happened to supersonic air travel? What had happened to the national investment in space exploration? And Stevenson also has uh, this time traveler say things on their return home which are haunting. Diseases that we in 1968 can easily treat with antibiotics have become intractable and are making a comeback. And even diseases that can easily be snuffed out by vaccines are coming back simply because parents aren't getting their kids vaccinated because they don't believe in science anymore. 
I guess my point is simply that things are getting better faster is actually a much more complicated idea than we often give it credit for, and dramatically so if we uh, consider the state of the entire world. But there is a way that rapid change does occur through technology, and most often for the better, I think, and that is when a technology becomes boring. Cars will always be too exciting. We're drawn to them. We can't have conversations about them. Um, everyone wants one regardless of how much they mess things up. We are just not going back to horses. And in the UK, at least, we're doing a really sterling job of giving up on trains as well. But, <laughs> but smartphones and tablets and e-readers are maybe starting to become just the right kind of dull. After you've used these things for a little while, you can start to make them do a few things really, really well and reliably. And then you lower the cost and you start to make sure that everyone has access to them. And uh, it's only then that you really start to realize what these things can actually do. Radio was like this, and TV, and telephones, and books, and photography. It was only when each of these things became kind of dull, kind of boring, that they actually started to become really, really powerful. And yet we could always maintain our conversations about them. We could always continue to ask, uh, what are they? What can they be? They are not aspirational totems. They take on the same rhythms and reliability uh, as sunrises and tap water. Um, what tablets and smartphones and e-readers do, what they are doing is starting conversations about the ways in which we work, how we relax, how we learn, and how we view the world. And the worst possible thing to do would be to shut down those conversations before we start to see where they're going. Which is why every time I see an article moaning about the death of books, uh, the death of reading, or how video games are destroying our kids' minds, or why can't we all just curl up with a copy of War and Peace rather than investigate the potentials of virtual reality, then I just want to scream a little bit because, you know, Give it a chance. Um, we don't even really know what television is yet. We don't even really know the true capacity of high-quality, ubiquitous photography. We certainly have no idea what carrying a small, powerful computer around with us at all times might yet do. So, we should be investing in great new devices, in exploring uh, what these new things might actually be able to provide for us. We certainly shouldn't be closing down um, uh, debates based on the strength of our old mythologies. We shouldn't be denying innovation based on the strength of our old mythologies. And by old mythologies, I mean those ways in which we develop a way of looking at the world which seems to have always been true, so that even the slightest change in that way of looking starts to manifest itself as a profound feeling of wrongness. But this just shows how much we care. We tend to place a tremendous weight on our artifacts, on our objects, on the things that we surround ourselves with, and we imbue them with a life of their own. This is really obvious to anybody who loves printed books. Anyone who really loves a book knows that they are much more than words on a bundle of pages. But they're not, of course. The bundle is exactly what they are. We just bring something else, something better, do our best to attach it, and with practice, we do. We make things special. Printed books allow us to play with paper, half-turning pages so that they pass by a little quicker, running a nail under an important line, dog-earing pages, doodling in the margins, mourning and then relishing the bangs and bumps and creases of the covers as they accumulate. And it's really hard to pinpoint the psychological effects of all of these little things beyond a broad sense of their adding importance. Um, but the fact that people mourn their loss suggests that there might be a real pleasure and maybe even a necessity to physical interactions in our day-to-day -day lives. But if this is the case, then the outlook for uh, e-readers and tablets is actually very, very help uh, hopeful. Um, if, uh, you know, th they are much more likely to not be just these simple mass-produced items, these lumps of plastic and glass that are so homogenous and so featureless that we cannot possibly fall in love with them. I think we can actually rely on users developing, uh, always developing new ways of handed human practice. This is part of our relationship with mundane objects. Um, in trying to find the boundaries of the things that we use every day, we always have to give something of ourselves back to them. I think that some cultural commentators don't believe that users will be able to place the same weight of importance onto their electronic items as they have to other items, uh, to older, more sensuous technologies like print. Um, but to me, that's what being human is all about, this making things special, about making things more than just things. 
We need to start vital conversations about conflict minerals and about the kinds of social, political, and environmental impacts that always occur whenever a new technology becomes essential. But I also think that we are allowed to marvel at how adaptable we are as a species and at the kinds of power that we can wield whenever we become experts with the very technologies that the last generation said would threaten to destroy us. Every stickered laptop, every annotated electronic text, every emoticon instant message, every nail varnished mobile, every comedy home movie, every tagged photo, every lovingly curated blog is testament to the fact that people have once again used these things until they are beautiful. We are building the history for our digital devices that on a long enough timeline will imbue screens with the same richness as paper pages. They traverse the same path. We create our objects, or we cause them to be made, and we use them, and we establish what makes them work, and they get made again, and we become one with them, and we make them sing. It takes a, tr uh, a tremendous amount of bravery to allow the next generation to try something new. We will always find ourselves in a state of consternation because the one thing that is always true of young people is that they will insist on the experiment. And so the question then becomes, do we have the guts to let them explore what scares us most, let alone to support them, let alone to follow them? Thank you very much.